welcome to this special talk by Ming Kyung Lee. Min uh, is currently a research scientist at the Carnegie Mellon uh, University Center for Machine Learning and Health. Min studies the social and decision-making implications of algorithmic technologies and use this research to inform the algorithm development process and to design their interfaces. Min received a PhD in HCI and master's in interaction design from Carnegie Mellon and a bachelor's degree in industrial design from KAIST. Please welcome Ming Kyung Lee. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Kimiko, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. My talk is titled, uh, Toward Human-Centered Algorithmic Technologies. And I thought that I would start by sharing a little more with you about myself and my research to explain how I got I interested in algorithms. I'm a, I am a HCI researcher, and I am trained in social science and design. I draw from both of these fields to make intelligent technologies that fit better into the human world. To give a few examples, I researched how to improve robot human hands off by looking at how people hand objects to other people. I analyzed the video of these hands off frame by frame and adopted the gestural cues I observed to design robots that can do the same. I did a qualitative field study with telepresence robot that helped distributed teams work in three different companies in the Bay Area. The result of the study not only yielded new understandings of how people collaborate through technology, but also influenced the design of commercialized version of the robot. I conducted a lab experiment that suggested when doctors talk with patients through mediating technologies, they may give riskier and more dehumanizing health advice than when talking face to face. I've been exploring how to mitigate this effect through interface design. But my interest in human-centered algorithm grew out of a project that asked, what would it be like to be live with a social robot? At the time, this was a few years ago, there was a no robot that could deliver services reliably in the field. So we built a robot called SnackBot from bottom up adopting a human-centered design method. And we conducted a field experiment with this robot in an office building where the robot delivered snacks to workers for nearly five months. And robot could speak too. <laughs> so what surprised me was that people started to form relationship with the robot despite clearly knowing that it was a pure machine. For example, one worker gave a robot a gift, a battery, in case the robot needed a spare in the future. The worker told me that for the whole first month of service, she hadn't cared about the robot at all. But one time, the robot apologized to, to her for a mistake. And after that, she couldn't help but feel that robot was a real being. What surprised me even more was that robots' impact went beyond the individual level, influencing social and organizational practices in that office. Workers reported jealousy toward other workers, whom they felt that robot favored. And there was rumor that the robot had a crush on a certain workers. And workers reported more social interaction with their coworkers as the robot sparked conversation and became something to bond over, like dogs in the park. These social and organizational implications of intelligent technologies are what inspired my current research on algorithms. Algorithms are less visible than robots, as they don't have physical bodies, but their implications for society are much broader. This will be the focus of my, of my talk. Algorithms pervade every aspect of our daily lives more so today than ever. Algorithms decide what we see online from Google search result to Facebook walls, news feed, Amazon ads, and Netflix recommendations. 
And they're not just in entertainment and social media. Algorithm can analyze massive amounts of data, enabling insights that human eyes could not have come up with alone. Based on this promise, algorithms are increasingly optimizing how we learn and live healthy lifestyle. Algorithms guide us through online content with personalized hints and feedback, and they set personal goals for us based on data collected from our watches and phones. There is a lot of active research now, right now on algorithms that can help doctors decide what treatment uh, we should get when we are sick. What I find particularly interesting is that algorithms are increasingly taking on the roles of bosses and managers, transforming how organizations work. Algorithms recommend top candidates for jobs, evaluate the performance of customer service agents, by analyzing their voices and connect patients with physicians. Algorithms have actually helped give rise to an entirely new types of workplace where customers are flexibly and efficiently matched with service providers through algorithmic technologies. And you experience this type of service if you ever used a Uber and Lyft. On an even larger scale, Algorithms are now being used by government agencies and cities. For example, the police can decide what time to patrol certain areas by using an algorithm to predict when those areas will have higher risk of crime. An immigration agency can use an algorithm to screen applicants. Perhaps most importantly, as cities and nations become more technologically advanced with things like smart grids and driverless cars, Algorithm can be used to help optimize how these resources are distributed. Because of these recent changes in an industry push for efficiency, the social impacts of algorithms are no longer negligible. And they are already influencing our everyday interactions. And some sociological studies estimate that 46% of jobs in the United States will be transformed by these algorithms in the next decade or so. So my vision is to design these algorithms to better support human values, motivations, and unique human capabilities. We already know that algorithms can make our lives and our work more efficient. But how can we create workplaces and cities that feel trustworthy, fair, and good to work and live in? And how uh, can algorithms motivate people and support what we are uniquely good at so that we can do more than we could do alone? And achieving this vision involves social and design challenges, not just technical ones. Today, I'm going to talk about three of them. So here's the first major challenge. There is an inherent tension between the hard set mechanical nature of algorithm and the subjectivity of human nature. Algorithms depend on quantifiable input, rules, and output. And this means that we need to somehow quantify management rules and human behavior before algorithm can understand them. Humans, on the other hand, make decisions using subjective judgment and nuances that do not always follow predictable patterns. This creates a challenge. No matter how much data we collect on human behaviors, there will be always be aspects of human action and interaction that cannot be quantified. People's aspirations, motivation, ability to be creative, etc and technologies that try to fit people into tiny pre-programmed boxes in order to optimize their behavior are likely to be rejected or to have unintended consequences. In terms of management, the theory of organizational behavior tells us that good managers do follow rules, but must also be able to improvise. How do we build the ability to improvise into algorithmic technology? The second major challenge is that the actual process of developing an algorithm can be subjective and value-laden. Despite widely held assumptions about the objectivity of algorithm, more and more, and more research shows that algorithm can actually make biased decisions based on how they were created. 
say we are developing a machine learning algorithm, and there are many points in the process where intentionally or unintentionally, the developer's biases can influence the logic of the resulting algorithm. For example, the behavior data algorithm used to find pattern could reflect biases in people's behaviors. On the, or on the flip side, the optimization goals and features that developers decide to use could reflect the developer's biases. Now we've already seen some instances of the two challenges that I just described in the real world setting with real world uh, result. For example, there was a case where Facebook's yearly review feature, which created personalized summaries of individuals' fa Facebook posts, accidentally highlighted events that people would rather forget. And there was another case where Google advertising algorithm only showed ads for high paying jobs to men, but not women. These specific examples may seem benign to you because sure, ads and social media posts can be easily ignored, uh, can be easily ignored. But imagine if mistakes like this happen in the allocation of work and resources in a smart city, in hiring processes, in medical treatment or predictive policy. Now that is a lot more concerning, and it means that we need to start paying more attention to the social aspects of the development process. The third major challenge is that we have very little understanding about the mental models and biases that people bring to their interaction with algorithmic technologies. For example, how pe people feel about working with an algorithmic boss in a workplace, and would they cooperate with the algorithm the same way they would do with human manager? In previous research on automation bias also suggests that people sometimes mindlessly follow or blindly reject algorithmic recommendations. And no matter how accurate the algorithms are, the system will fail if they don't account for actual human behavior. So in this talk, I will go over how I tackle these challenges with social science and design theories and method. I will first present my qualitative uh, studies with Uber and Lyft driver to get us thinking about human issues with algorithmic management. I will then present my ongoing work around designing more human-centered algorithmic management through the case of a smart city. In the last part of my talk, I will focus on a study I conducted with Fitbit users in which people were more likely to follow algorithmic recommendations when the setup process accounted for their underlying motivations. To start, let's take a look at Uber and Lyft workers' perspectives on algorithmic management. Uber and Lyft are interesting cases because their algorithms take on diverse managerial roles, assigning, optimizing, and evaluating work. So how many of you have used Uber and Lyft? <coughs> so almost every one of you. And how many of you are drivers for Uber or Lyft? So I have this question several times over the past year and it's interesting to see how everyone has used Uber or Lyft now at this point, but no one in the audience has ever worked as a re driver. And I think that says something about uh, driver population. But for those who are not drivers, let me give you some background on how algorithmic management works in these services. So for Uber or Lyft, independent drivers drive their own cars and use a driver app on their phones. This app-based work platform allows a handful of managers in each city to oversee hundreds and thousands of drivers. In the app, algorithms match driver with passengers requesting rides within minutes or seconds. The assignment algorithm is generally based on proximity, matching each passenger with the closest driver. The drivers are not supposed to search passengers on the street like taxis do. That means that drivers need to wait until they get assignment requests, assignment on their apps, which makes the assignment algorithm very important to their income. 
algorithm also dynamically changes the fare in particular locations based on the demand and show this information in real time. Drivers can go to surge priced area to meet the higher demand and also earn more money from the increased fare. And finally, algorithm help ensure the performances of the driver. The companies collect quantified metrics through their apps and periodically email drivers their performance records. They mainly use two metrics. One is how many of the ride requests assigned by algorithms are accepted by the driver. The other is the driver rating that riders submit at the end of each ride. If these metrics fall below a certain threshold, the driver gets a warning from the company and risks having their account to deactivated from the system. On the other hand, those who excel on these metrics are given opportunities to take on special roles for extra income, such as being a mentor or a recruiter. Drivers have very little direct contact with company representative, but they interact with each other through online forums to gain social knowledge of the system. This ride-sharing setting allowed me to explore the practices that emerge when algorithm assign work, uh, optimize work behavior, and evaluate job performance. Specifically, I asked the following research questions about the workers' experiences. Do human workers cooperate with algorithmically assigned work? To what extent are people motivated or discouraged by algorithmic optimizations? And how effective is algorithmic data-driven evaluation and how do workers feel about it? To explore, explore these questions, I conducted semi-structured interviews with 21 drivers and analyzed posts on online driver forums. This qualitative approach is particularly appropriate for uncovering new themes in this nascent domain. The driver in the cities were operating in 13 cities across the United States. They worked for a rideshare company about 20 hours per week on average and had a range of experience in ridesharing from three weeks to a year. The interview began with questions about driver's last ride and their best and worst assignment and ride experiences. And I then explore their understanding of algorithmic features and how these perceptions influence their work strategies. I triangulated driver experiences by conducting our archival analysis. I analyzed online driver forums, sampling posts that mentioned algorithmic features, and the company websites allow me to determine how much information each company shares about the underlying mechanism of their platform's algorithmic features. To analyze all these data points, I took a grounded theory approach. I open-coded the data and categorized them into emerging themes. So the overall theme concerned the conflicts that emerged from the tensions between the system and the worker's perspective. And let's look at this in more detail for each of the three algorithmic features I described, assignment, search pricing, and driver evaluation. The assignment algorithm automates the driver-rider match to maximize efficiency, but that means that drivers do not have much control over the types of ride that they are assigned. For example, this is a screenshot of a ride request. While drivers can choose not to accept the request, as participant four described, this type of request does not provide enough information for drivers to discern whether they want to go to the area or not, so it's difficult to say no. And as you can see on the screen, there is also no explanation of how each assignment was made. And this creates a safe backdrop for the company to continuously experiment with the factors that assignment algorithm take into consideration all behind the scenes. But many drivers want to have control over the types of passenger they picked up, so they create a workaround. For example, some of the drivers that I interviewed 
strategically controlled when and where they turned on driver modes to get the types of requests and clientele they wanted. They turned off driver mode in danger, dangerous neighborhoods to avoid dangerous situations. Went downtown for a successive short rides during the lunch hour. In the evening, they often chose to stay in residential areas where they could drive people to the bars instead of hanging around the bars and having to drive drunk people home. So that they did not compete with each other for passenger requests, drivers also distanced themselves from each other by checking other drivers' location on the map. Occasionally, Uber and Lyft offer promotions where drivers are paid according to the number of hours they keep driver mode on. When drivers want to take a break but don't want to turn off driver mode, they cleverly park in between other drivers' cars so that they won't get any requests. <laughs> the other way in which drivers sought control was to ask for more information about assignment algorithm on online forums. On both Uber and Lyft, many drivers' least favorite ride is a distant ride request, one that requires driving for more than 15 minutes. Two of our drivers learned from online, online forum that lo the longer a Lyft driver stays online, the wider his or her pick a radius becomes. They use this knowledge to avoid distant requests by periodically turning driver mode off and on, again at traffic signals. Another interesting thing was how the opaqueness of the assignment algorithm, which was meant to give the companies more room to experiment, sometimes backfired for the company. When assignments were undesirable or seemed to make no sense, drivers simply attributed them to errors and rejected them. For example, if a driver receives a request for a 15-minute ride, but sees that they're not the actually the closest driver, they may attribute the assignment to an error when actually the assignment could be have been made for a legitimate reason. But still, drivers were generally satisfied with their level of control over assignment algorithm. And interestingly, driver uh, participant 17, who was also a yellow cab driver, preferred his taxi driver uh, dispatching system where he could see all of his incoming requests and choose freely among them. He explained that he could strategically choose the location of right request with a taxi system, and he had developed knowledge of how to best do so. And Uber and Lyft's automated assignments did do not allow this fine level control and predictability. So that's the first feature, the assignment algorithm. And the second feature is the search pricing algorithm. To refresh your memory, the goal of search pricing is to dynamically raise fares in areas where customer demand is high, and in order to motivate drivers to go to that area and meet the demand. I actually thought that this was a brilliant idea, so I was quite surprised when half our, of our driver said they don't use the search pricing information. This was in part because of a mismatch between what algorithm assume people are like versus what people are actually like. Search pricing algorithms were originally designed to solve optimization problems involving non-human entities like hotels or airlines or toasters. And Uber and Lyft's algorithm operate on the assumptions that drivers are rational, economic beings, motivated by money, and who will follow instructions instantly. Drivers, on the other hand, have other motivations. Some in our study say they drove for fun or to help certain communities. Some people thought, thought that the search pricing was just unfair and were therefore uninterested in, in ser changing search price areas. And others said that search pricing changes too quickly, making it difficult to use the information strategically. And trying to chase search pricing is like playing whack-a-mole, they said. 
This tension between what algorithm assume based on efficiency and what people are actually like are also appeared in the third feature. As I mentioned earlier, Uber and Lyft rely on data automatically collected by their apps to evaluate and manage drivers. In using data, this data, the companies can easily sort through thousands of drivers to see who's excelling or doing poorly. And they use this information to decide whom to deactivate or to promote to roles with extra income. However, this quantified means of evaluation is not always fair to drivers. For one thing, the metric treats all assignment rejection as service failure, when in reality, not all rejections are the same. For example, female driver in our study would not accept male passenger without profile pictures at night due to safety concerns. And sometimes driver weren't just fast enough. Technical glitches in the app can give drivers only a few seconds to accept the request. And there are, these are legitimate reasons and circumstances for rejecting passengers, but assignment algorithm penalizes all rejections of passenger requests equally, which lowers driver's acceptance rate regardless of the circumstances. Many drivers also reported that their average driver rating was not very reflective of their performance. The driver rating is an average collective evaluation, and as this participant put it, if you're a Uber or Lyft driver, you're at the mercy of random people. And driver felt that many uncontrollable factors influence passengers' rating beyond just their driving and service skills. Passengers sometimes blame drivers for things like arriving late to a destination or having to accept surge pricing. Once their scores were above a certain threshold of deactivation risk, drivers seemed to develop a detached, indifferent attitude about their rating. For example, this participant stated, I used to micromanage my rating, so to speak. I used to sweat and be, my gosh, my rating is now going down. It's 4.85. But now I don't worry about it. I see there's lots of error that can place, take place in the rating. With all these issues, these quantified metrics did not provide very useful feedback for drivers as to how to improve their performance. It was therefore unclear whether the metrics actually motivate drivers to improve their work in the long run as the companies intended. Instead, drivers turned to online driver forums looking for peer advice on how to improve their ratings. For example, this person asked for advice on an online forum and received 30 to 40 comments with concrete tips how to improve their performance rating. So far, I've explained how people responded to three features of algorithmic work. And these responses were observed in on-demand transportation services, but offer important insight about potential challenges for other organizations like hospital, factory floor, or smart city that want to use algorithm to assign, optimize, and evaluate work. Before going into more details on this, I'd like to note that many of the design choices I've described seem to be geared toward maximizing company control and manage management efficiency. Of course, we can't really confirm this because the algorithms in our workings are veiled. But it seems that there is a lack of transparency across all design features and measures. To speak in terms of Jenna Burrell's uh, taxonomy of algorithm opacity, it is unclear in these cases whether the lack of transparency is intentional secrecy or whether the opacity arises from the algorithmic characteristics. But either way, the lack of transparency seems to give little control to driver and much more control to the company. And this raises the question, what would a workplace that more equally balances the interests of the company, the customer, and the worker look like? So now I will revisit the three algorithmic features observed in the Uber and Lyft using this angle. And looking at what design dimensions were involved, 
how they could have been designed differently, and what future research questions they raise. The opacity of assignment rules allow the company to continuously experiment, experiment with their algorithm, but it failed to inspire driver's trust. It caused a lot of speculation, and it backfired in specific cases of undesirable assignment. And how do we promote transparency and create trust but also prevent workers from gaming the system, like when they are turn, uh, turn the app on and off. The taxi driver mentioned that the lack of choices in assignments made it harder to create a work strategy. This, that participant did not like the Uber assignment system because algorithm made decisions that he used to make himself, and making him feel like he lost the agency to the next strategy he developed to maximize his income. This could be interpreted as resistance to change, but also raises open-ended ethical questions about the trend in new technology to sacrifice individual control for the sake of overall system efficiency, and it has implications for learning and development on the job. Algorithmic incentives, in this case search pricing, did not work as effectively as I initially anticipated in motivating drivers to go to high demand areas. The incentive was not ergonomically designed, it changed too fast, it operated on the incorrect assumptions that driver had purely financial motive for working, and some driver felt that it was just unfair. This finding suggests that for incentive uh, algorithms to work, their models of human behavior need to be expanded to accommodate diverse types of motivation and to consider the emotions people feel about the decisions that algorithms make. Here again, the lack of transparency of the reasons behind search pricing offers interesting questions for future research. Why do they actually show search price area instead of simply showing high demand areas? What if they were able to show additional contextual information about certain areas, uh, like certain events happening at the time, so that drivers could better make sense of it and estimate how long the high, higher demand will last? Algorithmic evaluation allows for management of workers at scale, but algorithmic decisions are not always fair or useful for drivers. And our study find, found consistent and arbitrary biases in customer ratings and showed that negatively interpreted algorithmic, algorithmic assignment acceptance rate does not account for exceptional cases where assignment rejection is justified. So in addition, the feedback given to driver was not actually useful to them. So future research should ask, how can we account for nuances and valid exceptions? How can we design useful, quantifiable metrics and rating system that are fairer to workers? And for example, is using the same star rating system we use for Amazon products the best way to measure the performance of the human workers? I'd like to wrap up the Uber and Lyft driver study with this picture. When manufacturing machines were first introduced into the workplace, trailerism was developed to optimize human behaviors around them. It took many more years to create a management style that was not only efficient, but also motivating and enjoyable for human workers. As algorithms begin to enter the workplace, it is our responsibility to make sure that workers' experiences remain a priority. So far, I explained my past work aimed at qualitatively understanding people's experiences with algorithmic management. Now I'm going to briefly talk about three of my ongoing research, all of project, all of which I'm really excited about. So in the first project, I'm exploring people's perceptions of algorithmic decisions compared to human-made decisions in managerial context. Uber and Lyft offered a real-world context where I could observe human issues that arise with algorithmic management. But they were both new work platforms, so their uh, algorithms were, weren't taking place of any previous human managers. But there are now some workplaces like the hospitals uh, or even Starbucks where the decisions that human managers used to make 
are increasingly being made by algorithms. This project experimentally examines potential issues and changes that could arise from this change in decision maker. So let's look at this example. Imagine that you apply for an internship at Google and you've received an email saying you've been selected for an on-site interview. Would your perception of decision differ if you thought you were picked by a human HR versus an algorithm that scans thousands of resumes? Previous research on source bias suggests that source characteristics can influence how you perceive the quality of certain types of content even when the content the source produces is the same. For example, your perception of this news article might differ if you learn that it came from the New York Times versus uh, the Daily Californian. So my hypothesis is that people feel algorithms have less agency and fewer emotional capability than people. And this perception will influence how fair or trustworthy they feel the decisions are as well as a, how they feel about the decisions in general. I'm exploring the impact of source bias on multiple dimensions of decision perception, but in this talk, I'll focus on only one uh, emotional response. I hypothesize that people res will respond less emotionally to algorithmic decisions than to human-made decisions. Previous research suggests that our interpretations of others' intentions reinforce our emotional responses to things. For example, people self-reported feeling greater pain from electric shock when they thought that the other person had intentionally chosen to shock them. So I predict that people will perceive no intention behind algorithmic decisions, positive or negative, which will weaken their emotional responses. To test this hypothesis, I conducted an online experiment where I manipulated the types of decision maker and whether the outcome was positive or negative. And I use a scenario technique like this one you see here to vary decision maker. And the results suggested that people in fact felt more positive when they were hired by a human than by an algorithm. However, whether the decision maker was human or not made no differences in terms of how bad people felt about not getting the job. So regardless of how algorithms work, people's belief and biases of our own algorithm can play a role in determining their reactions to algorithmic decisions. I'm conducting a follow-up study in order to better understand the underlying mechanism of this effect and how different design features of our algorithm may influence people's responses. So the next two ongoing projects that I'm going to explain revolve around designing human-centered algorithmic management. To refresh your memory, the Uber and Lyft study offered many research questions for the future study, such as how can we create algorithm that satisfy the needs of multiple stakeholders in a given situation? And how do we get people's preferences and feedback about services so that it, we can iteratively improve the management? To explore this question, we are building a smart community service that helps the homeless population. And this is in collaboration with people in Berkeley who are doing research on embedded sensors and control theories. To give you a little background, every year 3.5 million people in the U.S. experience homelessness, with 1 in 30 children becoming homeless. However, 21% of the people who need emergency food assistance received none. There are food banks and other volunteer organizations, but they lack real-time coordination among different community service efforts. This means while some food pantry have too much food, there are other pantries that had to turn away people who came. This results in an inefficient system where available supply is not matched with demand. To address this problem, we are building a community service system that aims to balance supply and demand 
by distributing resources, such as food, at strategic locations in real time. For example, restaurants and grocery can report having extra food. Sensors in the city will then determine the locations of the homeless, and our service will strategically decide where to provide these resources using mobile food pantries or trucks. This decision should be done with consideration to multiple stakeholders, ranging from donors, people in need, nonprofit organizations, volunteer to neighboring citizens. And this service is a great living test bed to explore how we can build human-centered algorithmic management. With it, we are exploring the following research question. How can a planning algorithm that decides where to pick up and drop off food to consider multiple stakeholders' needs instead of always finding an efficient route and method of distribution? And what would be a fair way of allocating donating resources? Many stakeholders in the services participate for altruistic motivation. How can we optimize a system for altruistic motivations and the happiness of multiple stakeholders? How can we involve users in the loop with the algorithmic technologies? How much should the allocation decisions be automated and how much should be left for users' choices? How can donors, recipients, nonprofit, and volunteers give feedback about the work? And we know from my previous study that the rating system can be heavily biased. And how can we reduce bias in this feedback system? So we are currently working with partner organizations in Pittsburgh who do food rescue, which means they, they collect food from donors and deliver to them to organizations in need. We are hoping to do a pilot test our system both in Pittsburgh and Berkeley next year. So in the work that I just mentioned and any other services that involve algorithmic management, creating fair algorithms that allocate work or resources will be important. If we adopt mathematically proven algorithm to divide goods or resources, taking account people's needs and preferences, would people feel, think, or feel that solutions are fair? My second ongoing project explores these questions. I've been conducting a laboratory study using a website called Splitted, which uses fair division algorithm for everyday solutions, a problem such as sharing rent, dividing house chores or goods. I'm collecting and analyzing data, a preliminary result suggests that there could be many disparities between mathematical fairness and people's notions of fairness. This could be true for a reason, few reasons, and one, it can be difficult for people to quantify their preferences for tasks. And as we know from the field of behavior economics, people can use different anchors to somehow arbitrarily translate their subjective preferences into numbers. Whereas the algorithm assumes that there is some true absolute scale of human preference. So, so far I've talked about how algorithms are managing people and resources in organizations and how we might design them to be more human-centered. For the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about another area where algorithms are influencing individuals and their decision-making processes. As I mentioned earlier, algorithms are increasingly optimizing how we learn or li live healthy lifestyle. So for example, a fitness tracker like my, my Apple Watch can analyze my daily step and set up a plan optimized for success. And most research in education uh, seeks to create personalized models of students to optimize education environments such as one that Jack Pardos develops here. And my research complements this work by focusing on human qualities that data-driven algorithms do not capture. Things like our personal motivation, aspiration, creativity, and unique uh, experiences. And harnessing these very human qualities will be important for the success of these programs. As one inspiration on how we might do this, I studied personal service providers. Services have been personalized long before computers were even invented. Service roles such as tutor or, and butlers existed centuries ago. 
And they are the ones who were carefully observing our <laughs> daily routines and appropriately streamlining their services to cater to our individual needs. So I chose to conduct interviews to study the practices of eight personal health service providers, such as personal trainer and physical therapist. And one of the most striking thing about their work was how they used an open-ended, reflective questions to elicit the underlying motivations of users. For example, let's look at this quote. My client may say that their goal is to lose 10 pounds or lower their BMI, but these are very generic goals and they are not what truly motivates them. So there is uh, so always something emotional and motivating for different individuals, so I keep asking why to truly understand the motivation. And many service providers told me that establishing rapport and getting clients' underlying motivations are just as critical to success as the exercise or rehabilitation program itself. Asking an open-ended question was the one of the common strategies they use across many different services. And in fact, there is a lot of research in social and cognitive psychology about why asking why can be so effective. Asking people why elicits reflective thinking, triggers underlying motivations, and can lead people to focus on higher level goals. And the idea here is to we use this dialogue-based strategy to assist people when using algorithmic recommendations. But would this strategy work when asked by computers? With human service provider, there is a social pressure for clients to cooperate with them. Would this work in technology? To elicit real reflection, I adopted techniques used in previous reflection research that suggest asking why question twice, instructing clients to take more time to think about the questions, and asking clients to write longer answers than they usually would do. I tested this question-based reflection strategy through a between-subject field experiment, and it was a part of a larger study that explored other hypotheses about goal setting, but today I'll focus on the effectiveness of the reflection with a goal personalized by the system. The study was done with Fitbit users. Fitbit is an activity tracker that people can wear to track their daily step. And using the API from Fitbit, I built a website, Fitbit Plan, that allows users to set up two-week long plan for increasing daily steps and to track their progress. For one group of users, the website asked uh, use a reflective strategy to assist in the plan setup process. For example, asking why they want to increase their physical activity and why it was important to them. Then the website used the baseline numbers of number of steps of users and automatically creates a plan that increased 2,000 steps from their baseline on average over the next two weeks. Once they created a plan, they filled out the survey about their experience and motivation. After two weeks, uh, we sent them another survey. And we also analyzed the changes in their daily steps and answers to reflective questions. So let's look at the result and start with participants' answers to reflective questions. When setting up the plan, in response to the first question, why they want to increase daily steps, participants gave a very generic short answer saying weight loss or improved mood. When asked again on the next page, participants gave more detailed explanation. And each reason uh, fell into one of the cat three categories based on whether it concerned participants' individual, social, or environmental self. And I prepared two example quotes in the next two slides, and please take a moment to read them. And while reading them, you, are, you can pay attention to the richness and uniqueness of each participant's response, which cannot be captured in the simple categorization. Uh, so this is a first quote from one participant.
And this is the second quote uh, from another participant. So these answers suggest that asking why questions twice was successful in eliciting participants' reflection on their motivations. In response to the second why questions, they use an average of 110 words to describe their motivation, whereas their answers to first question averaged at about 15 words. And did this reflection lead to increased motivation? It did not seem to make a difference in motivation day zero, when they set up the goal. In fact, all participants, whether they answered the reflective questions or not, reported being highly motivated to carry out the plans and increase their daily steps. What surprised me was the behavior throughout the course of the two weeks. Participants who didn't answer the reflective question did not seem to increase their activity for the two weeks, at least not enough to be statistically significant. On the other hand, participants who answered the reflective question on average walked about 2,500 steps more over the two weeks, which was a statistically significant difference. The results suggested that algorithmically set goal by itself was not motivating enough for people, and that it became effective only when it is asked people to reflect on their goal. Participants spent fewer than 10 minutes answering questions before setting up the two-week long plan, yet the simple reflection strategy seemed to have a significant impact on people's participants' later behaviors. So this work suggests that Fitbit's current personal trainer feature, which automatically sets goals based on their baseline data, may become more effective if it asks people to write down why tracking data step matters to them and display these motivation as a reminder. So I'm visiting the Fitbit office in May to give a talk about this work, and it will be interesting to see what we can do with the Fitbit data and service platform. My work on Fitbit also offers design implications for other areas where individuals' motivation and goal setting matter for the success of the service, such as education, health, sustainability, and finance. For example, asking students in a MOOC or users of Mint, a personal finance management app, to reflect on their goals and then choose between, uh, choose how they create the curriculum and savings plan may improve their motivation to learn and finish the program. And right now, in some of the services like Mint, they give a nod to motivation by offering a list of predefined generic goals that users can choose from. My work suggests that it might be more effective to offer a space for individuals to write down the unique significance that achieving a chosen goal would have for them. The Fitbit study used a self-guided process to elicit reflection, but future study could explore other methods. And nowadays, speech-based agents are becoming more available, like Apple Siri, Microsoft Cortana, and Amazon's Alexa, and it will be interesting to see how interactive dialogues, like those used in the early ELISA program, might be used to elicit reflections in users instead of self-guided process. The Fitbit study focused on one aspect of our interaction with algorithm, motivation. Going forward, I'd like to explore ways of, to better support sense-making and decision-making with algorithmic recommendations, two skills that people are uniquely good at. So I've started this exploration in the domain of healthcare informatics. At the Center for Machine Learning and Health, we are building two kinds of software, one that helps non-machine learning experts to analyze genomic data for clinical purposes, and another that helps doctors make personalized treatment decisions based on genomics. What's challenging here is that there is often ambiguity in algorithmic results. Few results are computed with 100% certainty. How can we use question strategies to help doctors and clinicians 
to interpret the data and make better decisions using both the algorithmic result and their experience and contextual knowledge combined. Now I'm getting to the end of my talk here, so let me just recap what I talked about today. The qualitative study with Uber and Lyft driver revealed very human issues that can arise as organizations move toward algorithmic management. My studies on smart city uh, looks at how we might design algorithmic management to be more respectful of multiple stakeholders' needs, people's altruistic motivation, and the human sense of fairness. The Fitbit explored a reflective question strategy as one way of tapping into human motivations uh, when providing algorithmic recommendations. My ongoing work further explores how we might use the question strategy to help people make sense of data and make decisions based on both the algorithmic recommendation and their own judgment. So in this talk, I hope I convince you that social and design perspectives matter in understanding and designing human-centered algorithms. We already know algorithms can make our lives and our work more efficient, but how can we create workplaces and cities that feel trustworthy, fair, and good to work and live in? How can algorithmic technologies motivate people to and support what we are uniquely good at so that we can do more than we could do alone. So this is a really exciting time, the right moment in history to shape how algorithm will in turn shape our society. Isn't it better to design technology for people rather than to ask people to adapt to technology? That's why I do what I do, to design algorithms that better support unique human values motivations, and capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. In the older management literature, there was discussion of something called the Hawthorne effect. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether you are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, organization of methods, people went to see if they could improve worker productivity and happiness by improved lighting, and they did. But they eventually found it wasn't the lighting, it was the fact that a human being cared, which mm -hmm. seemed to me very relevant to what you're doing. So your question is, the Hawthorne effect that uh, tested the intervention of lighting, but in fact was because of the experimental result that improved the productivity of this. Is it your question? Sorry. Oh, it was I a didn't, comment. I didn't, I, I, I didn't catch what you said. The, the conclusion in the simplified version usually known. Is this working? Oh, was that the workers, while they found better lighting nice, were more influenced by the fact that human beings were coming around to find out about their feelings and what they liked. And that, that was the real driver of the happiness and the productivity, not the lighting. Mm -hmm. I feel... I couldn't really hear the details, so maybe... I have bad hearing. Is the Hawthorne effect relevant to Uber and Lyft study? In general. Um, I think it's relevant maybe especially when I uh, we test the interventions that we think is good and maybe when we're measuring the effect. But uh, for Uber and Lyft study, I don't know if your question is about whether there would be any Hawthorne effect that could have biased people's responses to my question. I'll probably there will be less of those bias in the way they I kind of study the people's experiences, but they're something that I will need to be aware of when I deploy something in the real world and see the result. But I will talk to you later after the talk to better understand the details of the question. 
Ah, John. Thank, thank you for, I think, you know, very thoughtful presentation on some very important questions. I'm curious about uh, that last uh, project, the one with Fitbits. Uh, I appreciate the, the value, the significance of uh, encouraging reflection by the users. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how, the, how, to what degree the effectiveness of that depends upon the inherent trust level of the human individuals with the system that is eliciting the type of reflection. So for example, you showed those two quotes mm -hmm. uh, from individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how, if Fitbit were to design an interface to ask those questions, the individuals would be as forthcoming and as detailed about their you know, deep-seated motivations. Yeah. Um, knowing that, or, or with the assumption that, well, this is going to be now recorded and stored by a company and what are they going to do with that. So mm -hmm. trust and privacy, I wonder to what extent that may, may factor into the effectiveness yes. of the strategy. So in fact, when I deployed the website, I was not very confident they will work. I was like, who's going to answer this question seriously? So even though I was testing it, I was not very optimistic about people giving, like doing real reflection. Mm -hmm. So I was actually very personally surprised by the length and depth of the thought that they gave into in crafting those responses. And but for that, if we just consider that, I think that if, if we de deploy similar feature and Fitbit will work. But there is another level that whether people want to share those personal details with the Fitbit company itself, that's an uh, open-ended question. I don't know what's the image of Fitbit in general, and it depends on individual sensitive to sensitivity to privacy. So yeah, and then, then I also actually myself thought about if we say we are going to use NLP to analyze your answers to improve our service, would that actually make people share these like reflection like maybe less because I know that they will do something with the my answer where it's just recording it someplace. So those are some open ended questions that I can't really answer. Yeah. Uh, I got it. Okay. I really enjoyed your I really enjoyed your the Uber Lyft uh, analysis and how people worked within and, and uh, around the mm -hmm. algorithmics. I thought that was terrific. Um, my question is about the last part, the Fitbit part as well. And I think it's a, I think a pretty common obs observation that self-reflection is effective mm -hmm. in, in education. We yes. see that. Uh, but what, um, but you know, we all, I think there's a lot of evidence that the Fitbit is not it's a very small bit of mm -hmm. information and just having people walk. And I noticed from the responses that, that you gave the examples that the things that people were trying to achieve were not necessarily achievable with a Fitbit. Yes. So the person who is worried about her memory, um, I think that's mm -hmm. just, you know, there's something about when you get older, you're, it's not that your memory's going, it's that you have more things to remember and it's replacement, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point being, that this brings up some interesting questions about the responsibility of algorithms and so on. So should the Fitbit code interpret that and say, you don't need this friggin' Fitbit. <laughs> you actually uh, don't have a problem at all. You maybe just need you know, this other thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so how does all that fit in with your, hmm. your research program? And should you tell that to Fitbit when you visit them? <laughs> That's a really interesting um, question. So my, given that I give consent that Fitbit can use my, say, open-ended answers to do whatever they want to do, um, hmm. it's really interesting. It's also really like related to people's like discussion around personal genomic data. Like I did a 23andMe to see what it's like, and they actually found that I might have some cancer, but then right now there is a regulation that 
you can't really, Tell they me. can't share their information with me. Unless, so, there, I, I can, my personal, I, my personal opinion is if I consent, I, I know that if I consent that you can use my data and my answer for any future discovery that, that I may not enjoy, then, or I may enjoy, maybe if, I, if they say they, I don't have any disease, uh, then it might be okay, but, um, so then it would, be like, it would depend on people's consent and prior knowledge about what, whether they know what's happened, what will happen with their data. But there's also the really interesting story about like, also related to genetic tests, and now they give you choice whether you want to know whether you have some risk of Alzheimer. That really depends on, even though they know it, unless I, if I don't want to know it, they can, I think they can tell me that I have very high risk of getting Alzheimer because ultimately the decision is on me. So I think similar rule will apply for this kind of case too. So I just got to ask you, when I was a kid, I played Elisa. Whatever happened to her, the, the, you're talking about the, the psychology game of basically doing analysis of Elisa. Whatever oh. happened to, I mean, whatever happened to the program, I mean, in its existence, do you know? Oh, what happened to Elisa? I mean, has it matured and, I mean, or did it just die? It's okay, you mentioned it in. Oh, I meant by Elisa, I meant old computer software that was Okay, there used to be this game where you'd ask questions of Elisa, yeah. and they'd play psychology back and forth. When yeah. we were kids, we played this on the computer. And I just was wondering, what, okay, that, then your reference was in, in generality, okay. Okay, so, sorry, I, um, actually I haven't played with Elisa myself, so. That's, that's where it was born. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, great talk. Uh, are there contexts where you think we should not use where you would say, you know, you've, you've, these are all sort of nice applications to have Fitbit or, you know, Uber and Lyft. Are there applications where you actually think we should not allow algorithms to make decisions? I'm thinking of national security context or, you know, context where human life is at stake. Or do you think we can always put a human in the loop in a way that will mitigate those concerns? So I've been thinking of a lot about how we actually can allow or give like design algorithms that can take into nuances in, um, in this like real life human situations. And then as I think about it more and more, I also ask questions about why actually do we need to o automate that decision? Maybe what's lacking in the company or any other services is really good monitoring service, like software that shows what's happening and that really have agile and easy connection between the human manager that's operating this and the, the driver so that they can easily work around and address the solution. So maybe like I personally think that the whole solution about those rigidity of algorithm is not like making algorithm themselves more flexible. We could be actually finding more clever ways of incorporating humans' decision in the loop. And so, yeah, I don't know whether that partially answers your question. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much for a great talk. Um, and just full disclosure, I work for Uber. Um, but very interesting stuff. Um, my question actually was about the, the Uber and Lyft study. Um, and the finding which I, I've heard before that the drivers feel like they are dispatched areas where they might not be comfortable. Um, where they might feel it's a dangerous area. Um, at the same time, there have been studies that seem to show, at least, that, uh, that sort of automated dispatch like that is better for serving minority communities because drivers don't get to act on their bias that says that a black neighborhood is a dangerous area. Um, so I just want to hear your perspective on that. I mean, I think that this, it's a tricky issue. There's obviously bias in the algorithm. There's bias in the driver. There's potentially bias in the study that showed that they serve those, those neighborhoods better. Um, but I'm just curious on your perspective about that, about the tension between um, algorithmic bias or lack thereof and human bias or lack thereof in this kind of decision making, where perhaps the algorithm is, is in a way less biased than the human actor. So, so you're, 
so I would say that there has been actually studies that shows that P area with a lower economic status gets less access to Uber and Lyft services because drivers don't go there even though the system itself is, does, I wouldn't say necessarily have that bias, but it's a human behavior that's creating that bias. Um, so you're- So usually the contrast is between Uber and Lyft and traditional taxi companies that, that serve those neighborhoods even less well. With Uber and Lyft? It's be, sorry, the, the studies that I've seen mm -hmm. show a difference in bias between Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. um, which dispatch algorithmically, and traditional taxi companies, which have a human dispatch mm -hmm. and more agency for the driver, um, where the traditional taxi companies are less effective at serving minority neighborhoods. So that's contradictory result that I've seen, because I've seen the study said the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, I'm not familiar with this study at all. So you're saying that they found taxi was, Uber and Lyft were more successful in deploying drivers in low social economic status area than taxi. Yes. Was more effective. Yes. Mm. And then the, the reason why taxi was kind of biased is the human dispatcher who was not. I don't think that, I don't know if there was a specific mm. finding, but I mean, I think that the concept is that giving drivers more agency allows them to act on their bias to not go to minority neighborhoods or low-income mm. neighborhoods. So for that specific cases, I don't know whether it's a fair comparison because taxi might have been more expensive, so maybe they didn't call the dispatcher less. They called the dispatcher less, thus going less to the economic areas. Um, but that's really interesting because from my perspective, even Uber and Lyft, there is some phenomena that's reinforcing people's biases. Like maybe because of the driver population, maybe they're not from the area, so they don't go there. So the other idea will be like, actually, what if we use more specific dispatching system rather than giving them choice of where and when to work? So that's really open-ended question that I'd love to explore more. Yeah. Jenna. I just sort of wanted to join in on this conversation about Uber and, and algorithmic bias. Um, to me, it seems the logic that the algorithm allocating um, passengers to drivers is, as being more objective seems faulty because based on what um, Min has shown us, that it's very easy to just choose where you want to serve based on where you put your car and turn your, turn yeah. your service off when you're driving through neighborhoods you don't want to serve. And you know, we know there's this, been long been this practice called redlining where areas that, that have large um, low income and minority populations don't get served by banks and things. So I don't think there's any, I can see any difference in the way that works. However, I think there's something profoundly possibly positive in the way Uber works, which is that there's a reputation system for customers. And so if you're kind of known in the system, I mean, there's a, there a known practice of kind of taxi drivers discriminating against black um, customers when they hail them on the street. And so what Uber represents is a way of um, kind of matching passengers who are known in the system, who have a reputation for being good customers. There's, ra there's ratings for customers. And that, I think, is the, it's the reputation system and not the allocation of drivers to passengers that potentially has um, an impact on that, that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I will give him, but he raised a hand like, why will go actually? Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I had a question about uh, how, like, you touched upon the loss of human agency uh, for the driver's side uh, at, from the algorithm's uh, perspective, but uh, when you start e exporting these algorithms to other cultures and other markets, mm -hmm. it's almost, uh, I mean, you're exporting with the algorithms the values that have been encoded into them. And where does I mean, what does uh, your research, or if uh, if you have any thoughts on this sort of, it's almost a level. It's I guess uh, it's kind of an algorithmic colonialism in a sense that because uh, some drivers. So uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I have conversations with Uber drivers 
in other places. And uh, I found that a common theme that emerged in India was that they hated Uber and preferred something else because Uber forced them to accept only digital currency. And oh, only what? Only, like they would not accept cash, which then they would have to declare on their income statements and they would not be able to evade taxes. Uh, now, I mean, I, in this particular instance, I agree with the Uber side of things that it's, it leads to a more transparent system, but there are other, trans, other values and other uh, cultures that Uber has encoded from Mountain View and San Francisco and gone into other cultures and sort of uh, imposed it on those cultures. How do you feel, or what, what are your thoughts on this? Hmm. So your question is whether because it's a global company and they're, we don't know actually whether they're using same algorithm for, I think they use different algorithm for each city tuned uh, for uh, different location, but whether this, maybe the whole business model itself is contributing to, I wouldn't say Uberization, but some global. I mean, yeah, I mean, not just Uber maybe, but even for example, the Facebook. Facebook news feed. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's a really good observation, and, and I think there might be opportunities to tailor those. I wouldn't say algorithm, but maybe the choices, the level of choices that people have, like how much flexibility we should apply, like we should allow within the system, like those could maybe could be localized. Uh, for different cities, so so probably we should first stand. I I I think the Microsoft is studying the India's own Uber-like s system. I forget the name of the service. Yes, Ola, and it will be interesting to see how those local companies actually come up with these like scriptization or rules that govern the work and how actually they, whether that reflects the cultural differences and values because, yeah. a lot of these uh, sort of reflective or reflection um, eliciting apps. And uh, wondering to what extent are, uh, you know, you have more and more of these apps, are these apps actually going to start uh, draining our willpower and we start ignoring these signals from the apps to uh, actually, you know, be reflective? And can we incorporate context, for example, such as like, are you filling this out after lunch or, um, you know, after you got a good night's sleep or something like that, and how that affects the measurements? That's how that might affect the measurements and measurement. sort of the biases of the app. So I guess maybe there's two questions there. But yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely, the, my study was a short term. Like, we asked only question once, and we observed only for two weeks. It was not a four-month-long study or two months or a year. And I think definitely there will be a fatigue. Like, we all know that. Like hospitals suffer from the fatigue from a lot of alarms, and they stop, start keep ignoring it. Um, but I think that there might be something interesting with these emerging voice agents because we, the reason why we keep ignoring is maybe we are each time we get disappointed about those behavior. Like maybe I, uh, so it's, I don't know whether it's a alarm fatigue, meaning, but or whether we can cleverly designed so that, like human, if you ask, someone asks, check on me, I don't know, every two weeks or every month, maybe I won't like, ignore it because it's different each time and it's uh, different. And it reminds me actually, the, when I studied the robot in the field too, the robot was visiting the people's offices around the same time. It always started a conversation in the same way. But the reason why they kept engaging with the robot was the latter part of dialogue was always different and changing. And people who were engaging with the robot in the beginning, they continued to engage for the rest of two months or more. So I don't know whether it's really alarm fatigue or maybe the design of those alarm and content is wrong. So. 
Okay, Kamiko has once again algorithmically morphed into me, and I'm here to thank Min very much for a wonderful talk, which I was very good at, draw it to a close. And thank you all for coming.